Hey, my name is Alison Yomin Chiu. My pronouns are she or they. I'm the connectivity producer here at Company One Theater. And I'm Jessie Baxter. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the development manager and creative producer at Company One Theater. So welcome to the Better Future series. If you're joining us for the first time, the Better Future series is a digital gathering space bringing together Boston's artists, community leaders, and change makers. In season 23, as we highlight ways to build and invest in our communities, we're also continuing to celebrate and uphold anti-racist practices and affirm the narrative and practices of queer and trans people of color. Before we get started, we would like to begin by acknowledging that Company One Theater produces work in Boston, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Wampanoag, Nipmuc, and Massachusetts people. We affirm that it is important to understand and honor the history of the indigenous land that we occupy, while recognizing this acknowledgement is insufficient and does not undo the legacies of violence and displacement of indigenous people. We continue to take steps toward a future of decolonization and reconciliation. Thank you. So for the past 23 years, Company One has been making theater at the intersection of art and social change, using theater as a pathway to social justice, civic engagement, and this season, theater as public art. Company One staff, artists, and audience members are working together in redefining what it means to use art as activism or artivism right here in Boston. Today, we are diving deep with partner organizations who, like Company One, are creating mission-driven programming that puts their artivism into action in thoughtful and creative ways. These inspiring artist activists are changing the landscape of Boston one neighborhood at a time. So today we'll learn how BAMS Fest brings their annual music festival to life to fill Boston's summer air with the bees and voices of black and brown artists. We'll hear how the flavor continues is using street and club dancing to support their community members and join POW Arts Center and Asian Community Development Corporation to learn how resident-driven art making is enriching Boston's Chinatown. Each of these organizations is a compelling case study in what's possible when you combine the emotional power of the arts with the strategic planning of grassroots organizing. We hope these conversations inspire and encourage you to join Company One and our partner organizations featured tonight in using artivism to shape a better future for us all. And with that, let's dive in. Festival, second year. Boston, 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 Boston. Ladies and gentlemen, Eric Roberson. Yeah.
is Allison here. Um, now I would like to introduce the awesome humans from the Boston Arts and Music Soul Festival. Joining us today, we have Catherine T. Morris, founder and executive director of the BenFest, and Tim Hall, BenFest collaborating artist and former core team member. Welcome. Thank you. Howdy. So glad to be here. Yay, so great to have y'all. So a lot of C1 audience members may be really familiar with BAMFest, but I want to sort of make this space for those who aren't. Uh, I was wondering if we can sort of use this time for a quick rundown of the work that you do. And uh, uh, I can start with you, Catherine. So I was wondering, what was your initial vision for the festival and sort of the for the artists, for the community of artists that you're working with? Yeah, sure. I started the organization. Uh, so being a Boston native, I grew up in, at a time in Boston where talent shows, you know, really brought community together. Young people really were at the height of their their creation, their creativity. And I always was like in the middle of all of it. So even at the tender age of 13, I was creating platforms for my creative friends. Um, but as I got older, I noticed that Boston was really lacking uh, a bigger platform that would elevate the city in a way, particularly for Black and Brown artists, um, both not just from performing, recording, um, and visual, but also um, all the cultural workers that make you know festivals happen, the folks that you don't necessarily see. Um, I wasn't seeing a platform that really elevated uh, the visibility of kind of front of house, back of house, different types of artists. Um, and kind of the engineers behind making a festival platform happen. So I started to inquire from um, elders in the community about, you know, what was the Boston arts and culture scene, nightclub scene that they can recall. And they described a different Boston that I was just not experiencing. And so uh, folks were talking about things that were happening at Franklin Park, at White Stadium, um, basement parties, different nightclubs that were happening. And I, at the time, I recognized that, wow, we don't have as many outlets as the as my elders, as, as folks who have lived here longer than me uh, describe. And so for me, I felt like a festival platform um, compared to other cities and states that do festivals on a regular basis. I felt like I need to create a, a festival platform at the time that I started Bands Fest to ensure that we're raising visibility of you know, the contributions of Black artists uh, and creative entrepreneurs to the city that often had been ignored or taken advantage of economically, creatively, artistically. And so when I started the organization, the goal was literally just to create a festival. But over time though, um, you know, I couldn't come out swinging doing a festival because even though I'm from here, you still have to gain validation from the community, if you will. So started doing uh, smaller events across the city, different venues and spaces, inside neighborhoods that typically have not welcomed black and brown communities to start to build goodwill, a good reputation, give artists the opportunity to see themselves in different spaces that they may have not historically been welcomed to. And that allowed us to build our, our audience organically to, to prepare for the festival. And so what we learned in that entire time is that our festival platform is just one you know, way to engage artists throughout the entire process, but it's also important to build collaboration to strengthen the network, particularly for Black and Brown artists as they grow through their career so they're prepared for a festival type platform to be able to be in front of tens of thousands of people versus not knowing what to do and not do well on stage. So we've learned a lot since we started the organization. At the core of our work, uh, you know, we provide um, consultation services, con uh, curation services, uh, essentially job or gig placement for artists, front of house or creative entrepreneurs, back of house, um, as well as uh, professional artist professional development, whether that's connecting artists to resources or tools or best practices through our network or doing the training ourselves. And since then, we've been able to support about 400 artists and creative entrepreneurs since we started and have been able to go across different um, greater Boston communities and program or curate inside about 25 public and private spaces. Uh, and to date, we're currently about 15,000 people who in person have experienced our festival, our festival and our programs 
but virtually we've expanded globally to about 68,000 people expand, engaging in our content. So very, very excited about how it started and where it is right now. <laughs> Wow. Wow. Catherine, something that you said about sort of the, the effort that you put into supporting these artists and building, looking at their careers and making sure that they're ready for this stage and making sure that they're supported at throughout the year um, to get ready for this festive summer is really, really, you know, amazing to me. And I'm just thinking about that support and love to them and care to them. So um, I was thinking about this thriving community of local artists. So I was wondering, um, Tim, since we have you here, I was wondering if we can tap into your journey as a musician that's been a part of Vance Fest for uh, a long time and sort of how have you seen um, this art artist community change as Vance Fest has grown throughout the years? Um, absolutely. I think with most um ecosystems and communities you have you have a cycle you have a, a, a kind of like an artistic an artist journey life cycle where um, you have artists that are up and coming and they transition and navigate and matriculate through their journey from you know getting started to up and coming to you know getting some momentum going to becoming established all the way to you know they're able to sustain themselves fully um, from their practice. And I think we've been able to nurture and observe artists at all of those places. Um, and, and a lot of that has been um, Catherine's willingness to um, be open-minded to the art scene, Catherine's willingness to say, I don't know everyone who is here. So as a core team, we were very um, responsible for finding artists. In some ways, we were scouting and a and r and, um, artists from going to shows and performances to then just me being aware of who's in the scene as a, an active member. And that looks like um, not only do they have information out there about them, like a bio, some digital presence, a website, an Instagram page, a Facebook page, YouTube, something, um, do they have content out? Do they have actual music out and available for us to observe? Is that music um, recorded at a level that we feel is of quality, that is clear, that um, has a point of view, that is unique, um, that is sonically pleasing? Um, and then also, can they perform? And I think that's been the particular um, requirement expectation for for our team in that not only do artists need to have good music but they also need to develop a performance identity that also meets the level of opportunity we're providing and it's also created a expectation um, because we've identified and built multiple platforms that give artists the opportunity to develop themselves over time. So as we work with an artist over the years, we, we, any artist that we work with, they eventually you know, transition into our artist alumni um, database. And that database is what we go to first when big opportunities are come our way or when we're working with, um, you know, working on an idea or working with a partner to, to create a platform that's going to amplify the scene we're gonna to go to our alumni first because they've been through the rigor, they've been through the process of, of, of us offering them opportunities and them hitting the mark and them stepping up to the plate and, and really executing. I really appreciate you just sort of hearing this journey and sort of walking me through the whole journey of sort of this cycle and how the Benz Fest network gets to expand and the community, how how it gets to expand. And something that I'm hearing that I really appreciate was sort of, you know, you and, and other, other artists and Catherine all together being on the same page and having the same sort of on the same page for the vision for the kind of artists that you want to look for and sort of 
around wandering around the city like casting directors to theaters <laughs> um i'm also wondering sort of how the music and artistry of Benfest and sort of the artists and the types of music that I bring in are contributing and building pathways to social justice and sort of the um, the life cycle of music to how um, sort of it um, activates change and social change um, and impacts the community as a whole. Um, I can speak to, I think, you know, as a, founder ed led organization right you start off with this one seed of a vision and then it's really at that point once it's planted in the ground it becomes a community vision and one of the hardest things like any founder ed or led organization has to do is almost relinquish control as much as possible right like there's still a vision that has to be fulfilled <clears throat> and you know for for me what became very clear probably in our first if not second year was that to Tim's point, really having to lean into community much more than the original vision. And of course, that's very scary <laughs> because it's like, this can go many ways. But um, what has always been near and dear to me is that this, this organization, how it is set up, should really always encourage creative autonomy. And the team, the cycles of people who have been on our team have really taken that personally and professionally to take ownership of how to inform the vision, how to make sure it comes to a reality to get to a place of where we are fighting certain injustices and certain barriers. And one of those things really is by representation of people. Uh, I always knew that in Boston, when I started the organization, there was really not, there, there were a small handful of organizations and platforms directly going to represent black and brown people <clears throat> and then layer in arts and culture and then all the inherent challenges with that and it's always been intention of ensuring that bands fest really aims at closing um, equity gaps particularly around space around curation <clears throat> around whose narrative is on stage and off stage and to center Black and Brown people in that um, has really led to almost this cultural movement, if you will, around breaking down certain injustices or at least minimizing the barriers to that and widening the door as much as possible. And so we tend to be the first organization called now, it wasn't like that then, but called now to be a thought leader around how, how do you use arts and culture to break barriers? How do you use it to get the attention of state legislation or more funding or uh, more access to things or how to think about space. We are now part of those conversations through the learned experiences of artists. Because of that, we have been able to provide more um, job placement. We've been able to have artists see that they are more than just their main practice, that, that ultimately they are, they are content providers. And that can be sitting on a panel, that can be a guest speaker, that could be being a, an ambassador for the United States, that could be a, a teaching artist, that could be an instructor. There's just so many ways to just to diversify what, what, what an artist does, whether it's in music or visual art or performing arts, whatever the case is. Uh, we want to just make sure that, that artists themselves and creative entrepreneurs have such a diverse portfolio that allows them to generate income, that allows them to widen uh, their base in terms of audiences, that it helps build up their confidence and competence about what they know to be true and also gain new skill sets in that. I love that. I love that. I feel it feels like that you all, you know, the last part to me feels like that I'm thinking a lot about how you are you are curating artists to become activists and to find, you know, to be able to see the power of their art in other areas and sort of see them and let them know that they are that. So that's really, really amazing to hear. I think this particular moment is really awesome and really i feel like a lot of people this year are um having a lot of hopes and you know focusing on bams fest this year after um the pause so i was 
hoping you know we can tap into sort of what this moment means for you all and sort of what are your your hopes getting ready at this moment for a bump bumps fest 2022 i'm gonna turn to tim first okay. <laughs> um i think the one of the the, the most you know exciting things that f that it f that's coming to mind with the the prep for bams fest 2022 is the event i think the pandemic really impacted um our global world in such a visceral way it still is impacting our world and one of um when i think about the way in which bipoc folks have been able to survive the many atrocities that we've experienced is in community it's been in being in a collective space it's been um depending on our collective understanding of self of history of a need to survive of a need to exist and what this festival has meant to black and brown people in this community has been a collective space where they feel seen heard validated appreciated loved on and and like cared for that is essentially the energy that is you know embedded in in the grass <laughs> that the festival is on while you're there like to walk around this place and to see so many people smiling, dancing, um, hugging, um, to see the kids running around laughing, to see um, artists on stage as if they were gods and the, the entire crowd is, you know, singing their music, knows the lyrics to the work that, to the art that they've made. Um, to individuals getting recognized in the community for their impact and their work, to our local government showing up and showing out and showing face, to um, a team of volunteers who have been there since 5 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> setting up, <laughs> putting things together, um, to you know the moment where the final you know to business owners to the to the vendors that are setting up who are who are selling their work who are making a living during during the event to the 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 food vendors who are serving the food and sustaining sustaining folks and nourishing folks um through through food to the artists that are you know crafting a piece from their imagination <laughs> on a massive canvas for hours at a time to the the headlining act closing out the night and everybody's there um you know excited you know there was there was one year i think it was the first year where people are out there in the rain they're dancing <laughs> out and they were they were still with us um i think the what we're looking for is um a, a sense of connection to to one another and i think bams fest has been um even in its only the, the two years that we were able to physically have it to go to go from like 2,500, 3,000 people to seven in a year, um, and then to expect or anticipate 10 in our third year, and then for it to not happen, I feel like we're we're just excited to for people to be able to experience it and to have it again. Tim, hearing you talk about this, I'm like getting getting really teary thinking about the imagery that you were just talking about, thinking about this upcoming summer. And I feel like this is as we ramp into this walk into the spring, this is a summer that I look forward to. And I feel like this is a summer that everybody will look forward to. I am so my heart is so full thinking about this picture. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you.
is Allison here. I am so excited to be joined by folks from The Flavor Continues today, and so glad to be introducing Jin Yiduan, uh, co-founder and executive director, and Brian Lim, who's their co-founder and operations director. Welcome, Brian Jin Yi. What's going on? Good to be here. All right, all right. So I'm um, so happy, so glad to have y'all join the Company One family today. Um, so the Flavor Continues is the first community-led street and club dance nonprofit organization in the greater Boston area, creating dance events and workshops and uplifting members of the community at this interse intersection of historical preservation, public health, education, and well-being. So I was wondering, Brian, if you can Talk, tell us a little bit about who the flavor continues is and sort of your community and art of artists and dancers and help us paint a little profile pictures for us tonight. Yeah, um, uh, the flavor continues, although we're established in 2019, is, is something that's already kind of been going on much longer uh, prior to us being incorporated, um, just on a very community grassroots level. I think it's hard to paint the profile picture of the street and club dance community because of how intersectional we are. Um, you know, that it, it'd be the same as asking, you know, somebody to paint a profile picture of what the greater Boston area looks like um, because we are just that diverse. Um, and I think that's why street and club dance has become such a global phenomenon and is what we believe to be, um, you know, this powerful untapped resource that does need to actually be um, provided for. Yeah, absolutely. I really, really love the sort of the intersectionality that you're bringing up right here. Um, I think that's, um, I love this concept. So I was wondering if we can sort of delve into that a little bit and give Jingyi the space to talk a little bit more about how this particular kind of dance and particular this community is um, you're helping to connect this community to social justice and sort of how does your work address the individual needs of the community members? I think going off of what Brian was saying, right, as this community being kind of the intersection of a lot of different spaces, we have so many diverse individuals, and I think that really gives rise to a lot of different conversations happening. Um, you know, you have in the same room, there will be doctors, lawyers, people, um, artists, you know, of all these different varying backgrounds, races, genders, um, you know, different demographic identifications. And I think when you build a, you know, community and space where all these different people can come and intersect, um, can just really interact with one another, you get a lot of different conversations that come out of it. I think also, even if we kind of step out of that realm, right, and even if we look at street and club dance as a whole, right, this entire our form was really born out of oppression, um, and it was really cultivated by the BIPOC community um, to really be the space of, you know, liberation where artists can come and they can express themselves and they can really find who they are and really be able to, you know, hone in on that individuality, which is very important. And we see a lot of artists coming out with, you know, like growing in, in their confidence of being able to be who they are, expressing themselves, feeling like, hey, this is actually a safe space for them to be 100 percent, as opposed to, you know, going about society and feeling like they're consistently, you know, undervalued or consistently put down because of what society generally tells them. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the power of our community is at. I, I love that. I love that. I love hearing that, you know, um, it is, I, I, to me, I feel like it's definitely surprising to hear sort of, and I, right now I'm trying to sort of paint a picture in my head on how doctors and lawyers sort of when they walk out of their day sort of jobs and day duties and they, when they come into your space and they transform into new spirits and new sort of um, new energies that they embody. So I was wondering if y'all can sort of walk us through some of your programmings and some of your current workshops that you're excited about um, that sort of um, that are serving these communities and that are, that are engaging these communities in various ways. Right. Um, I think first and foremost, before we even get to the live events and the, and, and the workshops, because those tend to be more, you know, one-off milestone celebrations, right? Um, 
a way that we've pivoted during COVID was actually hosting regular sessions, um, which sessions in, 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 in our world are just like open practices where people could just drop in like community center style. Um, and those are spaces recurring for these particular art forms, because three in club dance, I mean, in, in the ecosystem that we have here and, and out of the actual communities we've been able to dig into, I think we have about eight different street and club dance forms. So providing space for them on a weekly basis to actually come in and just practice their craft. What, and, and whatever that looks like. Maybe some of them are just dancing for liberation within the original purpose of the dance and its, and its genesis. Some of them might be training for competitions or trying to uh, rehearse to put together a performance. You know, there's, there's so many different layers to all of that. And that's really what our open sessions are for. Now, later on, we might have a workshop or a live event. Um, but we find that, you know, to just teach a class or to just teach a workshop or just have an open event, when this open session is missing, it's kind of, uh, it doesn't really nurture and build up the community in the way that it's needed. The open sessions is the most important part because it's the actual part for the existing practitioners to continue the practice. Mm -hmm. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, and like to add off of that point, you know, like just to kind of paint a picture of what these sessions look like, you know, you could walk in, right, and let's say it's like a house session that's going on and you see somebody just getting down the corner and just kind of dancing and, you know, working on their steps. Um, or just like really feeling the music, you experiencing that, um, I think can have so many, you know, like that causes you to think in so many different ways, whether it's like, wow, I really like the way, you know, they're doing that. Now, how can I take that and make it my style, you know? And then that kind of brings in a lot of like, um, you thinking about what your style is about, you really harnessing down your craft, like thinking, you know, like, what this dance means to you and all of those things. At the same time, our dances are cultural practices. So, and we understand here, you know, we're all of the Asian diaspora right here in this room, that, you know, culture doesn't pass itself down automatically, right? It's the people that pass it down. Yeah. So these session spaces also serve as intergenerational uh, grounds for people to all come together. You know, you might be in a space where someone has been dancing for three decades and somebody else has been dancing for three weeks and everything in between. And they have this collective space where they're able to share and learn from each other um, to one, pass down uh, generational wisdom and knowledge of not just the culture, but even best practices within the dancing. But at the same time, we might have this newer individual that's then able to in turn teach uh, some of the older generations some, some other things that are maybe not even dance related Maybe it's, I don't know, some, some technology related, stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah, music related. Yeah. And, 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 and it's only through that interaction that you can actually have preservation and evolution coexisting at the same time. I love that. I love that. I really, really love the way that you named that. I think there's so much magic that I was able to hear sort of through y'all's, um, you know, design and like heart went into designing these spaces and designing this journey for folks. So I was kind of wondering, I wanted to tap into the concept of this community space and spatial justice that was built by y'all. Uh, I was wondering that, um, you know, I, I, I see you all have a beautiful, beautiful space that used to be in, uh, Kindle Square, um, and I and now just that, um, hearing that y'all are moving to a new space. So I was wondering how would it? What are your perceptions and like understandings of space and sort of space as a resource and as a space also as a tool toward you know justice and social change? Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, to start that off with, uh, I think space is something that we have consistently lacked and consistently been trying to find. Um, I mean, so I came to Boston in 2018, and ever since I came here, there has been not really one so solidified spot for all dancers and everyone to just get together. The spaces that I used to know that I could go to, like Green Street Studios or the hallways at MIT were all shut down, um, either due to financial stuff or COVID or some other type of things got in the way. But most of the times, you know, even as street and club dancers, 
oftentimes we don't really find ourselves with the money to be able to afford the rentals that a lot of these other studios are are you know like per proposing and then whenever we do find free space it's often hey you got to keep the volume down hey you can only be here for a certain amount of time hey you know whatever so it ends up just that we're consistently short on space and i know for a fact that this isn't only in um boston that we have this because i'm personally from san diego well I, my, my, my previous five years was like done in San Diego before I came over to Boston, but even out on the West Coast, there's always been like a lack of space over there too. And oftentimes the dancers are kind of forced to practice out in the parking lots or um, in all these different public spaces, but you know, there's not, there's never really been a space that's meant for us, um, which I find to be extremely unfortunate. So I think us just being able to lock down a base here in um, Boston for a period of time has been really beneficial because it was the first time when we really saw, you know, all different dancers from all different styles come together. And now we have these interactions where dancers are learning new styles or are able to experience the cultures of other dance styles because you're within that one common space. You know, we have community members interacting with one another, meeting other people that they would have never met before. Um, we saw, you know, community members being Rep, like going out to battles more, representing themselves more, traveling more together because now they have that ability to like practice and then come up to a point of where they can go to an event or going out to another city to rep. Um, yeah, like I think a lot of, you know, just like providing a space gave so much to our community because that's something that we never really had before, right? It was like a base. And that I think was probably one of the most powerful things that happened. And it's, it, it's just a, it's an unfortunate truth across the board that street and club dancers, you know, uh, I guess we'll just speak for like USA until the very recent past, um, by recent past, I mean, handful of years, um, have been able to kind of have spaces for themselves in this type of way, you know, which I think is the importance of us doing the work that we do to validate street and club dance and, um, in, in, in the arts and culture ecosystem and just in general overall. And to just like, you know, talk about briefly, we mentioned like the United States, right? We've had several people come to our space where they mentioned, wow, this is like the first time we've seen anything like this in the US. Like where they really experience like a cohesive space where it's like, oh, I want street and club dance programming, you know, like culturally centered street and club dance programming where they could come to us and they can be like, oh, this is like one of the only spaces in the US that we can find. And meanwhile, you know, like tying in like this idea of space, right? Like internationally, when I went to Osaka, like they had an entire train station that was carved out for people to just practice. And you can go there 24 seven at all hours and they would never kick you out. You know, you had all these like different designated corners. You can bring your own speakers, you can plug it in. It doesn't matter. They have studios where street and club dancers can actually go to, and it's actually like focused on the art forms themselves. You know, I went to one of their public universities where street like and club dance was actually like a declared major to where they could get the education that they need, do the performances, really go out and perform at like the clubs and like showcase, you know, like the different dance styles and all of that. Their dancers will often travel over to the United States to sponsor by their government. You know, like there's so many things and so much support the international community has gotten that we often find missing in the United States ecosystem. Thank you so much for naming that. Thank you so much. So I feel like this is definitely like tapping into my next question and next, next curiosity a little bit. So I guess I wanted to ask you all, what are some of the tangible ways that our folks today, folks who are seeing this today, could support your work in this community of artists? And with that, what is a better future that you want to name, a better future that you want to call out to, that we can collectively um, gear everything that we have to move toward? An immediate way that they can help, you know, uh, something I learned street performing is the best nation is a donation. Um, so uh, what was our donation portal? Um, give butter. If you go to give butter slash the flavor continues, you should be able to donate. Um, or just go onto our website, um, visit our website, check us out. Um, we also have a newsletter that you can sign up to be able to engage with us in other different ways too. Yeah. Or just, you know, um, bring us up. You know, the performance opportunity 
you see that there's um, you know an uh, availability of some open space somewhere or they maybe there's some program where they want to bring some creative programming into a space you know bring us up plug us in yeah. um, in terms of what a better future looks like for us I mean I always think of it as and, and I, I always use the Boston Ballet as an example just because in that dance world you know they have their own institutions and such already um, that are self-sustained and even you can get scholarships for it and all that they have their own spaces and, and when, when somebody says they, they practice that craft it's, it's, it's validated um, and there's people that don't know anything about it that might go see it in the theater or something you know however it is that they put themselves authentically forward I would like to take street and club dance into that level yeah I believe that we are already ready for it we just haven't been validated by the ecosystem quite yet for that and I really want to you know go off of what Brian was saying too in terms of um, like sustainability right and really building like an ecosystem or I would rather say cultivating this ecosystem that already kind of exists for us um, really reaching out to people of different ages you know like we have our education um, part of TFC that really engages like our younger audience or people that may just be coming into street and club dance um, older audiences too alike you know they're really able to come in through that way and then by that way we integrate the new members into the community through like that method of movement and like self-reflection and eventually they get into these sessions right and from these sessions they get into these these events and then they interact with the greater community like there's this kind of whole event and chain that is really happening right and I think understanding you know like in those events like we have our elders and our ogs coming in to be the judge or to just come interact with these people or to be like the mcs or the djs or etc um and i think really being able to bring everyone together through all these different methods right whether it's like the workshops that we do or the education things that we do with the collegiate colleges that brian was mentioning um cultivating that creating new partnerships with other nonprofits out there who have a similar mission whether it's by serving the same demographics or um, serving kind of that same purpose, right? Um, I think that's also something that's really important. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you both so much for the, these words of wisdom. And I think these serves as wonderful momentums and inspirations for your community, but also for the Company One community and also the greater Boston Arts and Culture community to go beyond, to delve into your vision of how you, you know, hope to build your ecosystem and give us, you know, tangible ways to help support your vision. Thank you so much.
Hi, Allison here. We are so honored to introduce our PAL Art Center, who's joining us for their second Better Future episode, and also along with many other collaborations, and this time with Asian Community Development Corporation to talk about their Residence Lab program. The folks joining us today are Cynthia Wu, Director of PAL Art Center, Gina Chang, Director of Community Programs and Design at ACDC, and Lili Xie, who is an artist and residence lab co-facilitator. Welcome. Thanks for having us, Allison. Hi. Thanks, Allison. Of course. Of course. We're so happy to have y'all. So I kind of want to sort of delve into um, today with to start out with Cynthia and Gina a little bit to say that I really appreciate this moment because last August, C1 produced the Boston Chinatown musical um, together with Pal, and sort of in the writing process, we did an interview with ACDC staff. So it's so wonderful to have this reunion moment for C1 and sort of host all of you again. So. Uh, I want to use this moment for a quick refresher uh, to say that. Could you uh, give us a little bit of context uh, of PAL and ACDC's work in Chinatown and beyond, and sort of how, together with that, how this partnership came together in the first place? Yeah, sure thing. Um, I can give a little bit of background on ACDC first. Um, so ACDC, we invest in people and the places they live, so um, specifically working class immigrant families. Um, we do that by building affordable housing, by helping build generational wealth with financial literacy classes, and then lastly, really trying to raise up local leaders who can shape their neighborhood. Um, and as we all know, or as you might have seen across Boston neighborhoods, Chinatown is rapidly changing. And if you look around the room in these public meeting conversations, you might see elders, you might see some young people that we've organized, but you don't really see a lot of um, like working adults mostly because they have kids to take care of, their parents. Um, it's just hard to get out on a weekday evening. And so we realized, oh, this is like a really big gap um, and a voice that's missing at the table. Um, and then Q Pao, um, they came into Chinatown and I'll, I'll let Cynthia actually introduce Pao. Thanks, Gina. And um, so Power Center opened in 2017. It's a partnership between Boston Chinatown Neighborhood Center, or BCNC, and Bunker Hill Community College, as well as many community organizations um, in this development, such as um, agency, uh, Asian CDC, uh, as well as South Cove Community Health Center, uh, South Cove Community Health, and the City of Boston. So we really are founded to uplift and celebrate the narratives and stories of um, Asian Pacific Islanders in the Boston and greater Boston area. And the way we do that is really by leveraging and using arts, creativity, and culture um, and education to do that. And what makes um, our work so interesting and I think Power Art Center so unique is that it's really, its mission and its vision is really to support and give opportunities for um, BCNC and Bunker Hills constituents to have better futures and more opportunities. And it's also really an, um, a testament to the belief that all these organizations that we have worked with believe that arts and culture are not just a luxury, but really um, critical, um, as critical as any social service um, um, programs that you might get at BCNC from childcare to learning English um, to job placement. And that we really do believe that, that by using arts and cultural activity, we can really improve the health of individuals, families, and um, our neighborhood. So that kind of segues into, you know, that neighborhood component um, working with ACDC. Um, as I mentioned, for those of you who don't know, Power Art Center is located uh, physically in a building that ACDC developed. Um, so from the beginning, ACDC has, has you know, uh, been a part of the, this process. And, you know, I think Gina and, ha Gina and I, when I started, had many conversations about um, how we could use arts and cultural activity um, to support residents. And one thing that um, Power Art Center was really interested in was also, you know, I should back up and say, like, when we opened, we were getting a lot of calls from artists and artist groups about, like, oh, we want to work with Chinatown community members. Um, and, you know, of course, then I turned to 
Gina and ACDC who, who work directly with community members. And we just started talking about, um, I'll pitch it back to uh, Gina to talk about kind of some, some of the ways that ACDC was already using arts. Um, but I think the seed was that we were noticing that there was a huge desire from artists in the community to really work and engage with people in Chinatown. Um, and there was also varying levels of um, understanding on how to do that um, in a really holistic and thoughtful way. Um, and that's kind of the, one of the seeds from the Power Art Center side of how uh, Residence Lab um, came to be. Yeah, exactly. Just chiming in. Um, yeah, we saw that there weren't like working adults in these public meeting conversations and it was so in inaccessible. And if you ask the average person, hey, you want to come out to this town hall meeting? <laughs> um, it's not the most <laughs> enticing ask. Um, but if you say, hey, you want to come with your kids and have dinner and make some art together? They're like, oh, I can do that. My kid loves art. Um, and that was like one really accessible way that we actually made urban planning um, and kind of like disguised it in art making. And then residents realized, oh, not only am I, can I be a community planner, but I'm actually also an artist. Um, and, and that's like the beauty of this collaboration that working with Pal and Pal's, um, the artists that Pal brought in and um, teaming them up with residents to shape land in Chinatown um, has created this program of a lot of opportunity. Wow, wow. This is so amazing to hear. And that is, all of that is so smart, I want to say. It's so smart. And I really appreciate hearing sort of you tapping into, your, uh, like giving a lot of thoughts into building this a holistic and thoughtful way um, um, into all, all of these thoughts going to the program. And I really want to say that I appreciate um, uh, Lily joining us today to have you sort of telling us uh, about the journey of ResLab from a visual and installation art artist mind. So um, could you tell us a little bit about how your vision drives the making and launching of ResLab as an artist in this process? Yeah, for sure. Um, ResLab, I was really lucky to be part of um, the inaugural co cohort of artists back in 2019. Uh, I was on a team with um, Crystal B. Wagner, who is another wonderful artist. Um, and together we were working with um, two Chinatown residents, Bi Hualin and Yu Yi Li, who are residents in some of ACDC's buildings. And um, it was a great process. The program uh, ran for a couple months, I want to say, <laughs> um, where we were doing workshops. We had Gina leading us. Um, Cynthia was out on maternity leave at the time. Um, so uh, we had some really great workshops on community uh, history, on co-design. Um, it was my first time being exposed to concepts like that, you know, like what it means to be designing artistic work together with people who don't maybe consider themselves artists. Um, and I think from that process and from what we learned, it was really important for us to make a lot of space to uplift um, what the residents wanted to see and what they wanted to communicate. Uh, and like Gina was saying, there's, um, you know, I think a lot of people don't realize that their hopes and dreams for their community is sort of in the, first of all, you know, is sort of what, you know, planning a community can be about, and then also is within the realm of possibility. So I think a lot of uh, my work with Crystal was very interested in um, imagination and in what it means to make things that you imagine visible and collect them together and put them in conversation with each other. Um, so with Crystal and Bihua Yuyi, we ended up building um, a small installation that in many different ways uh, was housing residents' imaginations for the future. Um, so we had um, Crystal did a workshop with the youth in BCNC um, to collect a series of drawings about what they hope for in Chinatown. It was things like chocolate fountains and uh, free donuts and also things like homeless shelter, public library. Um, so those drawings we sort of um, reprinted onto fabric that was making the sides of the installation. Um, also during the exhibit, the opening of Residence Lab, we had uh, um, these sort of ginkgo leaves that people could fill out that had questions that are very similar to questions you might hear at a planning town hall. Like, what do you hope for the future of your neighborhood? Um, what are your 
concerns uh, and dreams for Chinatown. And with those, we sort of, those are sort of decorations for the installation too. Um, and then one more thing I wanted to mention, which is, I feel like one thing that I love about Residence Lab is this deep connection between art and um, kind of like community politics, I guess, um, and the ways that they can sort of inform one another that the development of the neighborhood can be influenced by the art and the art can be influenced by the development of the neighborhood, which I think is a really powerful thing. So um, for us, we were very lucky to um, be able to keep working with the ideas that we were sort of gathering with the um, initial program and installation. And um, we ended up uh, taking a lot of the leaves that we collected with all the hopes and dreams and compiling them into a zine uh, where we sort of put them alongside different kinds of like data about Chinatown, um, sort of reinforcing one another. And then, um, and then the leaves were also in the Chinatown Community Master Plan, which is a community, a community led master planning document that sort of outlines what the community hopes for the next 10 years of Chinatown. So um, yeah, so I feel like I went on for a while, but I feel like it was a great experience. Um, uh, definitely shout out to my collaborator, Crystal, and um, our amazing collaborators, Bihua and Yu Yi as well. That's so beautiful. That's so beautiful to hear. Oh my God. And I'm right now I think I'm really excited that you are coming back to uh, Residence Lab every year as the co-facilitator. That's super, super exciting for me to sort of to be able to see the structure that you are able to build um, together, uh, continuing into the future. So I kind of want to tap into a lot of things that you just said, Lily, and sort of to ask about, you know, how, in your vision, how do you feel like the artistry of Res Lab are building paths ways into social justice and act activism and sort of you know how do you define the activisms in the art that was created in the res residence lab yeah great question um i have a, a couple thoughts that i want to hear from gina and cynthia too <laughs> but um i think that activism can take many forms, you know, I think we see that a lot in Chinatown, which has such a strong activism and organizing community. Um, I think the way that as artists and as people that are making creative work, the ways that we participate is, um, and I think one thing that ResLab is great at is to be able to um, activate people's imaginations of their neighborhood and sort of contribute to their feelings about how much control or power they can have over their neighborhood. Like, I think what's really key is in a neighborhood like Chinatown, where there's so many working class folks and immigrant folks, um, you know, people are not always told that they have any say over what happens in their neighborhood, right? Especially as, you know, Gina was saying, you know, these sort of working adults, you know, who don't even have time to, uh, you know, participate in these, you know, community engagement forums, things that are supposed to be open to the public, you know, they it's not accessible to them for many reasons. So, I think art has a way of accessing people on a completely different level. It can, you know, be outside of the town hall, like physically. I think it also taps into people's feelings and emotions and um, can sort of translate the things that we feel, like the frustrations or the hopes um, into very real things that can happen in our neighborhood. Uh, and ACDC and POW have both demonstrated this in like many other ways that I'm sure we'll talk about. <laughs> um, and then, and yeah, I think, I think ultimately it contributes to a feeling of, you know, oh, maybe there is a reason why my neighborhood looks the way it is, why there are certain services available. And um, maybe there's a place for me in all of that too. Um, and I think also on top of that, you're not just the political stuff, but also building the feeling of community. You know, I think for me, participating at ResLab was so meaningful because it was, um, I got to make so many strong relationships that still, are really important to me today. Like obviously with Gina and Cynthia who are both so amazing and I feel like have mentored me through a lot. Um, and then, and yeah, just having made connections to the rest of the community. I don't live in Chinatown, but um, it's been very special to get to know people that way. And I think also just the way that through making art, it's it's just fun, it's playful. You can be goofy and silly. And um, I think that that does a lot to create a feeling of being together and, and of, you know, this like feeling of community that, you know, that work can mean a lot of things, but, um, and I think that's really, really important too. But yeah, I wanna pass it to Gina or Cynthia to add on. That was so good. <laughs> 
Um, I just want to like, yeah, just say like ditto to everything Lily just said. But um, yeah, I think I can share a little bit how we think about um, arts and culture and its role in activism uh, as an organization. Um, since our bread and butter is really building housing and like running youth and resident leadership programs. Um, and so it kind of seemed like, oh, what's this housing developer doing <laughs> with arts and culture? Um, but the way that it fits in is um, we think about soft power like arts and culture and how it actually builds hard power. And that hard power is like financial power or investment. It's also site control like land power. It's also political power. Um, being able to tell decision makers that actually I'm the decision maker <laughs> in this neighborhood. Um, and like that's that's like the main way that we look at all of our arts and culture projects. It's uh, building housing is like it takes seven to 10 years in Chinatown. It's unreal. Um, but it, so it's just like so slow moving. You can't actually shape proactively conversations or you can't even respond to current things. So for example, the last big affordable development we all built, and it was a huge visioning project in Chinatown, um, Airbnb didn't even exist when it first started for context. And that was like a big challenge in the neighborhood by the time it was done. Um, so doing arts and culture actually helps us be agile, helps us shape public conversation. Um, it helps us respond and like manifest the possibilities that residents are imagining um, in real time. and. I think the, the important thing that Lily said that I really want to highlight is the playfulness. Um, it's like, it's just emotionally exhausting having so many serious conversations about your livelihood and about your place of living. Um, and it does take, I think Cynthia talks about this a lot in a great way, but there's an emotional burden that we have to recognize in the neighborhood. And, and so how can we do this in a way that's actually healing, that can hold space for all the feelings that you have? that can bring it with also some lightness and um, in a way that makes room to just be like human and have joy too. Um, and so that playfulness, I think is a super important part to just the sustainability of these conversations. There is so much that we could unpack in the <laughs> last two comments, but I think in the interest of time, I wanna uplift a few, a few things, you know, to respond now Allison, to your question about um, um, you know, activism and what it looks like. I, I think I can, I'll, I'll speak about two or different topics. One, like with artists, um, you know, I started this conversation talking about how we were getting a lot of phone calls about artists who want to work with community members. And then we're like, what's also our responsibility? We can't just, you, you ask and now, well, I'm going to give you to community member, like really thinking about what does like real engagement look like in a way that benefits the community member like um and beyond just this community member should be part of this artistic process so it can see the artistic process you know as gina says like that is not a value that you know some people might value but not everyone so how you know setting up this the structure of this program is really meant to provide a training ground for artists to really have the time and the space and the support to learn about what community engagement looks like in their practice and to you know um, give a shout out to Lily now like really as an example of someone who is from the pilot program made all these connections Lily talked so eloquently about these connections and now Lily has the power now you know she just did projects on her own that you know we didn't really need to support she had the connections to carry out um, these projects and connect with these community members and make these voices heard and, um, you know, I appreciate Gina a lot. You know, we talk, talk about these conversations. How do we create pipelines? And, and Gina, I remember in a conversation you said, like, what success would look like for this program is that if this program didn't need to exist anymore because artists were empowered or exist in a different way because artists were empowered to connect with community members. Community members understood the power um, and impact of creative and artistic practice and they could advocate for themselves and they could connect, um, you know. So, so that, that is what I think of our role in activism. How, how can we create these structures that make these relationships possible? Um, because it's all about people relationships, right? And we're like an institution. Um, and and the secondly, I just wanted to say um, in the sense of, you know, the idea of connecting and belonging like that, that 
ideas really baked into both what Lily and Gina said about creating community, um, process, just getting to know each other. I think that is a form of activism, neighbors knowing each other, artists knowing each other, community members interacting and, and um, doing work together. Yes, yes to all of that. I just want to take a moment to thank you all so much again for all the work that went into this and thank you so much for the beautiful wisdom and stories that you shared with us today. And to say on behalf of a lot of folks, I am so looking forward to engaging with Res Lab in the future in this summer. So yay, I'm excited for that. Thanks, Allison. Thanks for having us. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for joining us for Artivism in Boston, case studies at the intersection of art and social change. And a huge thank you again to BAMS Fest, The Flavor Continues, POW Art Center, and Asian Community Development Corporation for sharing their work and vision with us tonight. Please visit us at company1.org slash betterfutureseries for more info, resources, and some action steps that you can take to support the socially-minded artists and organizations using their artivism to enrich Boston's communities. If you enjoyed this program, we hope you'll consider making a donation to Company One in order to support upcoming events. To donate, you can visit company1.org slash donate or Venmo us at company one hyphen theater. That link and our Venmo username are also in the description and the chat for this video. And lastly, we have a link to a survey in the chat. We hope you'll let us know about your experience with today's program. Thank you everyone.